None of these countries exist yet in our time. If we go back to 100 BC, 55 BC, thereabouts, those there, uh, none of these countries have been discovered, if you will, by people with a written language. The Celtic stock indigenous tribal people there have not encountered those learned people, if you will. But we understand how this could happen. For instance, if you are coming from the North American continent, you'd be familiar with the idea of an indigenous tribal people that are discovered by a bunch of settlers that come through the region. It happened once upon a time, they came through, they found his people, they called themselves Blackfoot Apache Cherokee and Sioux, but the settlers that came through referred to them as savages. But we understand that concept of a people getting found by a, a people that have a written language, and that is what occurs here. 55 BC, these people, if you will, are first written about by Rome. Boom. <laughs> Rome, like the plague that it is, has been spread across the known world. They've, they've now defeated the Gauls, the Germanic regions, and they've pushed through into southern Britannia. The Britannian people, the Celtic stock tribes in the south, fight against the Romans. However, by 84 AD thereabout, Rome had conquered all of the Britannian tribes in the south, and that had now become part of the Roman Empire. <laughs> there were two really good rebellions, however, against the Romans. In the west, a man by the name of Caraticus was able to get the tribes to join him on the western slopes to fight against the Roman soldiers. And he did exactly like the old movie scenes that you see, where you've got all of the... Isn't it funny? All roads lead back to Rome. ...and the Roman horde on its side of the field. And they march at each other, and the barbarians, what? Die miserably. Yes. We discovered, uh, the Celtic stock people up there, that the Roman shield wall was a formidable foe. Caraticus learned it the hard way. He fled the battlefield after the battle was lost, was eventually tracked down, captured, him and his family, hauled off to Rome, and forced to march around in the Colosseum to represent the fallen barbarian horde of the north. That's the last of the uprisings in the west. Now, in the east, there was another uprising that occurred about 10 years later. Now, here's Rome's gameplay. Rome moves into your area, they defeat your military, they remove your government, they put a governor over your land, and as long as you pay the taxes and keep the peace, Rome will pretty much leave you alone. And you thought that was an American concept. Yeah. So the king of the Iceni tribe in the east had made a trade agreement with Rome that they would pay taxes and not come under attack. And they put a garrison of Roman soldiers there. Now when he died, his wife, his queen, came to power, which wasn't necessarily unheard of in these Celtic tribes. were a matriarchal society, which means the women were the head of the clan more often than not. So the family name, the, all the leaders. So for the queen to be in power, that was normal for these tribes. Yeah. Rome wasn't having any part of working with a queen or female. So the Roman legion removed her by force. Many of you probably know this woman's name. Her name was Queen Boudicca. Boudicca was, the right, was uh, taken prisoner by the Romans uh, where she was beaten. Uh, her adult daughters were then sexually assaulted in the public square. The Iceni tribe rose up against the Romans and slaughtered the garrison in the Iceni lands. Free Boudicca, and she called the other tribesmen to, uh, to her banner. And they went to the, they marched on the nearest Roman fort. By the time they arrived, over a thousand had joined her, and they were able to put that Roman fort to the torch. Boudicca wasn't done. She continued along that Roman road to the next garrison. By the time she arrived, continuing to call people to her banner, she was over 3,000 strong, and she put that fort to the torch. By the time she reached, uh, she continued to march along this path, she was headed toward the major port city that Rome had built when they first conquered these lands, that they named Londinium. Modern day London. Wow, really? <laughs> London, very good. She, she, was, she had determined in her mind that she was going to set herself all the way to Londinium. By the time she arrived, the historians, Roman historians at this, estimate that her army was over 30,000 strong. She was able to put Londinium to the torch. Her march was a bloody march. Every village, every Roman village, every Roman fort that they sacked, they destroyed, laying the walls low and dismembered every body they killed. Bloody stuff. Uh, however, the legion that was supposed to be at, at, at Londinium at that time was currently away building another fort, which would eventually become York. They returned, and when they did, Bodica pulled out of the city to fight them in the open field. 
Her generals told her not to do it. She replied, words to the effect, if you, if you cowards choose to live as slaves, so be it, but I, a free woman, will fight and die for my land. And the generals were like, okay, I guess we're going to war. And he did, and he marched out to meet the Romans on the open battlefield, and he lost. Uh, it is a kind of a, there's a controversy whether Boudicca was killed in that battle or took her own life rather than being captured. But that was the end of the uprisings in the East. And at that point, Rome now was uncontested, in, uncontestedly in control of all of Britannia. At that time, now wait a minute, Rome speaks what language? Latin. And therefore, Britannia, they referred to as Britain, Britain Britannia, because Rome's creative like that. <laughs> This was now part of the Roman Empire. And at that time, the Roman Empire went from modern-day Britannia all the way to North Africa. Now, when Rome tried to push into the north, things changed. And then, again, it's not that Rome didn't have contributions in the south. I mean, they, they built roads. But other than that, there's really not much that Rome contributed to our society. Libraries, water. OK, libraries, aqueducts. But other than that, Okay, but bathing is highly overrated. <laughs> and you use soap. How weird is that? It was mostly an olive oil base, so what's up with that? Italian. Everything's got olive oil on it. But when Rome decided to march into the north, everything changed. The scouts went into the north to scout out those lands before the invasion force went up, and they came back and they told the generals, don't go. There are monsters in the forest. There are demons in the trees. There are deaths in the woods. Don't go. Because that happened a lot. We realized that we couldn't fight against the Roman shield wall the way that others had. And we didn't fight that way anyway. Rome, well, Rome is essentially cowards at heart. Here, why don't you come up here? No. Essentially, I can prove it. Go over here. Need a shield? Let's see, you know what? But it, you know, you wouldn't be fighting alone, though, so. I need a volunteer. Back. Come on over here. All right, what is your name? Griffin or Blue? Griffin. Okay, is this your only living heir to the family name? No, go on. This should be okay. You volunteer? All right, good. All right, so let's get this on you. Here we go. Safe as you go into the Pictish lands. Are we about to watch someone die? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, right, there we go. Now let's get you a mighty bucket for the head. And a mighty Roman sword. <laughs> <laughs> It's a Roman Rome. short sword. It's accurate. Hey. <laughs> I think, and so is the shield. <laughs> Could you imagine those things weighed a ton, and they had to carry them like this with that little short sword? <laughs> That's what made them effective, though, because they had like a certain order. They'd do them in, and then they would get you. And the whole line would move at one time. And behind them would be pikemen reaching over the top. And behind them would be archers shooting the enemy. He's annoying. However, fun fact for you: if you thrust out and thrust forward, if he's all by himself, his entire left flank is completely exposed. So when the most important man in battle to him is his right hand man. The guy on your right is defending your, your exposed side. You don't want to owe me money when we go to war, right? They just settle those debts before we get out there. Now, again, we realized we fight against this shield wall without dying miserably. So we had to fight ourselves. <laughs> we didn't have all of this stuff. In the Scottish lowlands, the ground is fairly foggy and soft. We didn't wear any armor. Uh, if, if we wore anything, it'd be similar to what I'm wearing. And of course, we referred to ourselves as Caledonians, and we had all of our Celtic names. But the Roman soldiers referred to us as Pictavi, the Picts. Latin word for paint is Picti. 
And for some reason, they referred to us as the painted barbarians of the north. I'm not quite sure why. <laughs> Maybe I do. The pigs would paint themselves up with woad. Woad is a bush indigenous to Scotland. You take the leaves, you grind them down, it releases a blue indigo-like dye that we would use to stain our clothing and our skins with before we'd go to battle. And sometimes woad is all we wore to battle. <laughs> and we side by side with our women. <laughs> and it was Scotland. These people are nuts, I'm telling you what. <laughs> you make wood by grinding down the leaves, I said that. Could you imagine you someone naked coming after you with an axe or something? <laughs> <laughs> You're in trouble, yes. And the more, the, the rant, more rancid the urine was, the better the stain was. And it was supposed to have a slightly hallucinogenic effect. What could go wrong? <laughs> and then they took shrooms and became berserkers. They would use behind the wall. Got your open it in. Hold it up. So the gladius is not necessarily sharp on the edges, but it's a great stabby, pointy weapon. And this is how they are advancing as they stab and thrust. The fighting side blade would be sharpened, which is a little bit longer. That's a side blade there. Uh, but they would have a shorter one that they would also carry with them. We, on the other hand, are carrying a Celtic leaf blade. Only two places in the world we find a Celt as a leaf blade. Uh, one is in these Celtic lands in the north. There's a Greek version of this, but it's fatter and shorter. This design, especially with the anthropomorphic handle, is found only in the Pictish lands in northeastern Scotland. But this is our blade, and this is what we fought with. It is not a stabby weapon. Because of the way forward design, if I were to run this through Griffin here, it would get stuck on his body. That'd be like, dude, sword. But it is a great cleaving weapon. The way forward design, as you chop with it, it builds up speed. And so you're not aiming necessarily for the body, you're aiming for joints. You're looking for elbows and shoulders and knees and... They dismembered heads. you. Heads are especially what? fun to chop. <laughs> <laughs> so, a little more fair in there. I don't know what healthy play that is. That's right, insurance makes us wear these for, for fun. Okay, so. I've still got to get to the joint that I want to hack off. So our other favorite weapon of choice is the bearded axe. Here's the purpose of these two weapons working together with one another. So we didn't attack Rome once they were in formation. We waited until they were on the march, and we came running out of the, across the bog, across the fog, out of the mist to attack them while they, were, while they were on the move. We'd attack them while they were in their camps. We attacked them at night. All those legends and lore about demons in the forest were true. They were us, and we were having a wonderful time with them. <laughs> the purpose of the bearded axe is you rush after the guy, and he's trying to get himself ready, is to grab that shield. And the leather strap behind it that goes around his shoulders. So as I grab that, that axe, takes control. Away, it causes him to lean forward, which exposes the back of that head. The weight and the, and the, and the, the speed of the, of the uh, leaf blade is sufficient to sever the spine. And drawing it back had enough force to be able to sever the head and have it fall to the ground in a single blow. So much fun. <laughs> <laughs> the helmet. So it's got this little visor thing on the front of the seat. This is designed to stop a, a knife blade, a sword blade, from seeing directly through it. However, it also has this wonderful chin strap, very good for holding the helmet on the head. But once the head comes off, it does a really good job of holding the head in the helmet, which made them really easy to pick up because you grab that visor and you can rip that thing back. It comes with a carrying handle. You got that nice chin strap down there that's holding the head in there. Makes it real easy to take off the battlefield. We did that a lot. We take it back to our, our, our villages and they were coming out of the steel age. This makes a really good stew pot to get rid of this thing. So we make a good stew pot out of that. We take these, we let them sit around our camp, get nice, ripe, and stinky. And it was not unheard of for us to begin the battle by throwing severed heads back at the Roman legions. <laughs> <laughs> so much fun, we call it bowling for Romans. <laughs> oh, no, no, I'm telling you, whoever came up with this helmet design was definitely thinking ahead. <laughs> yeah. If I kill... <laughs> Dad would have loved that joke. <laughs> <laughs> so, Centurion, Pigeonary, you know what? I don't care. This is a great group. <laughs> Rome 
started losing lots of soldiers. When they would march into the north, the body count started piling up. You died well. Thank you, Griffin. Give him a hand. <laughs> Rome doesn't like to write about its defeats, only its victories. And so they weren't doing a lot of writing about these defeats. However, we know that it was going well for us. Because in 122 AD, mm -hmm. under Emperor Hadrian, three oh, legions kids. marched north to build Where'd you get these? Over there. Hadrian Three for 20. All kinds of <laughs> I love so it. Gate down Rome. I, I so let here, him have one. Three legions, 5,000 <laughs> men were fighting legions. <laughs> Hold on, I gotta record. March north to build this that still exists in the northern, northern England today. It was a 75 mile long. Now you should use these images to like, tell them to shut up, basically. They would light off <laughs> when, 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 when the pets came raiding across the wall. It is the only defensive perimeter wall, the only frontier wall that were ever built. It was because of us. Emperor Hadrian basically, we're just going to call that the northern edge of the empire and be done with it. And so it was for about 35 years or so, until Emperor came to power. Under Antoninus, 